Well, hello and welcome everybody to the latest in our series of Kickstarter Science Colloquia. Um, just as to begin with our usual range of reminders, uh, we are going to be recording all of the Kickstarter Colloquia and those recordings are being posted on YouTube for the benefit of the wider community. And if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please kindly keep your camera off. And in the interests of being able to hear our speakers during the talk, please mute your own microphone if you're not actually the one speaking. You are encouraged to post questions at any time using the Zoom chat feature, and we will have a discussion session at the end of the, the colloquium. So today we're going to be focusing on what LSST observations of galactic globular clusters will be able to tell us about the dynamical histories of these stellar populations. And leading that work, I am very pleased to introduce Andrea Kunda and her collaborators, Joanne Hughes, Kristen Larson, and Katie Devine. So take it away. Thank you, Rachel. I'll just go ahead. Oh no, it says I cannot share my screen. Let's try it again. Here, I will share my screen. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Rachel, for that introduction. And we are excited to share with you today about our work on a more complete understanding of the connection between the galactic bulge and its globular cluster. Um, population. So our collaboration, which is listed here, began about a year and a half ago when the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust put together a new program called the RAISE program, where RAISE stands for Research Across Institutions for Scientific Empowerment. This program was designed to boost the scientific productivity um, at private undergraduate institutions in the Pacific Northwest. And so it incentivized faculty to collaborate with neighboring institutions and come up with a science um, topic that was more sophisticated and wider in scope than any individual could do by themselves. And so this is how I came to work with Joanne Hughes at Seattle University, Katie Devine at the College of Idaho, and Kevin Covey and Kristen Larson at Western Washington University, and I'm Andrea Kunder at St. Martin's University. Um, we all use stellar populations to piece together the formation and evolution of the Milky Way galaxy, um, but we all use slightly different angles and techniques. So my interest lies in the inner galaxy and especially the old stars there. Katie's expertise is in the galactic plane and the interstellar medium. Kevin's expertise is um, on local clusters and stellar population near the sun. Kristen works on extinction and interstellar dust. And Joanne's science involves observational imaging of stars, both in globular clusters and in dwarf galaxies. And so we are working now together to ask the question and probe the question, what proportion of the stellar population of the bulge, which you see here, has been is composed of stripped globular cluster stars? We are very thankful for the Kickstarter grant, which has given us resources to explore in more detail the bulge globular clusters, NGC 6569, BH261, and Patrick 99, and we are thrilled to present our results, um, at least our preliminary results here in this um, colloquium series. So I wanted to start by showing a picture of the Milky Way galaxy and the optical pass bands. The galactic bulge is the central part of the galaxy with a radius of about three and a half kiloparsecs. It's notoriously difficult to study because if you zoom into this region, you see it's a very crowded, um, hard to disentangle stars, there's source confusion um, issues. And you also see that there's these dust lanes. Um, extinction is also it obscures light coming from stars and makes this a challenging region to understand. But the bulge is an important um, area in the Milky Way galaxy, weighing in at 20 billion solar masses. So it is half of the mass of the disk. The number of globular clusters in the galactic bulge is still under debate. The current Baumgart and Vasiliev um, globular cluster catalog lists 160 confirmed Milky Way globular, cl globular clusters, and a third of those will reside in the inner galaxy. But the VISTA variables in the Via Lactea survey, the VVV survey, has put forward more than 100 new bulge globular cluster candidates, um, making us think that maybe our senses of 
globular clusters in the bulge is, is incomplete. And we still are possibly lacking an understanding of how these globular clusters fit into the picture of the galactic bulge. This is a picture of the globular cluster NGC 6569. Joanne is leading this analysis. And you can see it, this globular cluster consists of thousands of stars that are all gravitationally bound. And they are some of the oldest objects in the universe. So just like archaeologists use fossils to reconstruct the history of the Earth, so we are using globular clusters to reconstruct the history of, um, of the, the, the Milky Way galaxy, in particular, the inner galaxy. Here is a simulation that shows what would happen if a globular cluster um, gets too close to the Milky Way. Globular clusters, as well as, as well as dwarf galaxies, will fall into the Milky Way galaxy. They will become tidally unbound, and eventually they will mix and become a smooth um, stellar halo. The stellar streams, well, which you can see here as these green um, green air areas, are uh, when stars when when these um, events are in an intermediate stage, when the object is in the midst of tidal disruption, and so the stars are still spatially and kinematically coherent. It is thought that hundreds of streams um, from dozens of accreting objects exist in the solar neighborhood alone. And indeed, we have been finding more and more streams, especially in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, here is, uh, this is thanks in large, largely to the Gaia um, space satellite that is measuring astrometry um, of a billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Here is a view of the Milky Way from Gaia. And uh, I think Gaia has made it really clear that our Milky Way galaxy is not static, but dynamic. Stars are moving, and uh, how they are moving, what their motions are, determine the structure and what the Milky Way looks like today. And in particular, we have seen substructure, stars moving together in the halo of our galaxy. This is a map of a number of streams that are presented by Abed et al. in 2021. All of these streams are in the halo. Um, and the inner galaxy would be located right here, and you see there are no streams that have been discovered in the in our galaxy so far. This is largely due to the effects that I talked about previously, high reddening, high source crowding. How do you um, find substructure in such a dense um, region? We believe, though, that now the time is ripe to start undertaking studies of streams also in the inner galaxy. Today, there are several large-scale photometric as well as spectroscopic surveys studying the inner galaxy. And so similar how the Milky Way halo has been, has, has been unraveled thanks to um, these streams, our search for extratidal stars around intergalaxy globular clusters will help us reveal what building blocks contributed to the formation of the, uh, the inner galaxy. We are using the Blanco de Cambolge survey, BDBS, to help us in this endeavor. BDBS is a mini LSST survey because it uses the same passbands as LSST, U-G-R-I-Z-Y passbands. Um, this is the central region of the Milky Way, and here are the fields that we have already surveyed. It's 200 square degrees so far. This year, we're also probing to the northern part of the bulge. BDBS uses the DECAM imager on the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory, which has a two-degree field of view and consists of 62 different CCDs. And so in one pointing, we can actually observe a large number of stars over a wide field. Here are the 200 square degrees that we have um, successfully imaged. We have 250 million stars with photometry, with PSF photometry in uh, six passbands, U, G, R, I, Z, Y. Here is a figure showing the density maps for D, red, and C CMDs from BDBS. Here is the color magnitude diagram of the bulge. And this is the red clump, which is clearly visible. This right here is foreground contamination. And so we clearly pick up the red clump in all of our fields, similar to the VVV survey, which is an infrared survey imaging in ZYJHK passbands also picks up the red clump. And for most of our fields, we also see um, the main sequence turn off, the very, the very top part of the main sequence turn off. That's how deep the photometry goes. And BDBS is one of the largest photometric homogeneous surveys of the um, inner galaxy. Um, so we can combine BDBS with Gaia proper motions to select candidate extratidal stars around globular clusters. There has been a, a recent suggestion that especially the middle poor stars in the bulge could have been um, tidally stripped stars from globular clusters. This plot shows some chemically anomalous giants 
as surveyed by Apogee. Uh, their nitrogen abundances are very high, much higher than would be expected. Um, and this could be explained if this star was, uh, if, if these stars were born in globular clusters and have since been stripped from these clusters and are now residing in the field. But we have, and so our question is, can we see this kind of tidal stripping occurring um, in, in real time? We can also use chemical abundance abundances to see if a star is, uh, was once a, uh, a globular cluster star. Uh, the bulge has a metallicity distribution between minus 0.5 and 0.5 dec, whereas globular cluster stars are typically depleted in iron. So um, we will, we're also using chemical abundances to try to confirm um, and say something more about the extra tidal stars that um, we are finding. Um, let's see what this slide shows to reload. So this should be a map right here of the 20 globular clusters that we are finding extra tidal stars around. Maybe I should reload the link and see if I can get that to, hold on, see if I can get that to load. I think that's what happened. So last time I'm just going to try to reload the presentation and see if the figures will come up then. All right, I will reshare my screen. Apologize. All right, and we were on this slide. All right, right there we go. So um, here is the inner part of the galaxy. Uh, the 20 globular clusters um, in the BDBS footprint that we are focusing on are shown as orange triangles. And we received um, funding from the Kickstarter grant, which we're really thankful for, to purchase time on the Anglo-Australian telescope to get spectroscopic follow-up of um, our extratidal candidates around the globular clusters, BH261, which is located here, Patrick 99, which is located here, and NGC 6569. Here is our group at the Anglo-Australian telescope. We weren't sure if we would be able to travel there in person, but um, Australia did open up and here we are on the catwalk, um, getting ready for a night of great observations. These are all our candidate extratidal stars that we observed um, around our globular clusters. The first question we had to ask ourselves is how do we detect the best extratidal stars? And especially what do we do about the extinction? And Kristen will now talk about her efforts on this. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Kristen Larson. I'm an associate professor of physics and astronomy at Western Washington University. And, um, and it's really been exciting for me to be part of, um, of this collaboration. I've, I've learned a lot because my expertise was not in stars, but in dust. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the project that we did over the summer with, um, with an undergraduate student as part of the um, the RAISE collaboration and, and give you a, a little bit about the, the ongoing work we're doing to characterize uncertainty in the cluster parameters due to foreground dust. So dust in the Milky Way, this is a picture of uh, EB minus V. This is the famous SFD map, Schlegel, Finkbeiner and Davis. And I think astronomers of a certain age, all of us have used this in one way or another, this map from the mid nineties. Um, and this map was based on um, on infrared emission from the dust. And it's best in understanding the reddening and, and extinction for the diffuse cirrus and the diffuse ISM. Where this map um, has is not really designed to be used though is in the densest part of the interstellar medium, um, especially the interstellar medium of the, the midplane of the galaxy toward the bulge, exactly the, the, the region that we wanna study for this grant and for this collaboration. So next slide. That is certainly not the only um, map now. There have been many, many more. This is just a, a sample here that have been added to the SFD map. Um, and lots of these maps use different kinds of data, use maybe infrared data, maybe use photometry instead of the thermal emission from the dust grains. And all of these maps are meant to be used in a different setting and context. So um, there are actually more than, than are just here. There are some that have been done by comparing the photometry to models of the stellar populations, um, say the Besanzon models. And so there are many, many others um, and other maps that, that you can use. 
what this means then is that there's going to be naturally some uncertainty in exactly how we're going to correct the data for the presence of foreground dust. And the question I wanted to ask was, how does that uncertainty, the uncertainty in how we do the correction, how does that propagate then to the uncertainty in what we know about the cluster? We need to know the cluster parameters in order to accurately find these, these extra tidal stars. So um, I'm going to give you an example then. Um, next slide. This is an example from the Bay Star 19 from the Green et al. map. The Green et al. Um, 2019 map uses Gaia data. And so it is. Uh, it allows us to get more accurate extinction corrections farther out. Um, and for those of us who maybe are just new to this um, field and are putting these um, kinds of corrections together on our own, you can go to dust maps on GitHub. And if you're using the Rubin Observatory LSST analysis environment, dust maps is already built in. So this is what the extinction looks like um, in the GPAS band around one of our candidate clusters, Patrick 99. And uh, on the right is the the two mass um, the two mass field, and you you can see that that making extinction corrections uh, accurately across this field is is going to be important. So next slide. One of the other things I like about the green um, at all 2019 maps based R19 is that it it is resolved along the sight line by distance. So for example, if you go to their website at argonaut.skymaps.info, it allows you to type in the, the object that you're interested in and see where the dust is along the line of sight. So in particular, you should note that these um, site, these dust maps are good for in this particular line of sight out to a distance modulus of, I don't know, maybe 14, 15, um, 16. And for Patrick 99, this candidate cluster, the distance of this cluster is about six and a half kiloparsecs right at the line of where we can determine. And in fact, it's right at the point where additional extinction has been included in the line of sight. So if it's a little bit closer, you're gonna have less extinction, um, this EG minus R by maybe 0.05 magnitude. Furthermore, the other good thing about these modern maps is that they don't just give you a value, they're probabilistic in nature. And so these, um, there's different sampling here along the line of sight as the lighter blue colors. And you can see, again, there's a little bit of range in there. So all of these things contribute to this uncertainty. So here's how we decided to assess the, um, the impact of this uncertainty. Next slide. I'm not going to show you Patrick 99. What we've done so far is NGC 6569. 6569 is actually not in the green at all 2019 dust maps. Um, so um, we're going to use a different dust map, and we're going to use a dust map that's actually specially designed for BDS. This is the Simeon et al. 2017 um, dust map that has been converted into the BDBS passbands. But um, what we decided to do is that we would take the BDBS data for these candidate clusters, correct them with the special BDBS um, extinction map, and then add some amount of randomized small unknown extinction to see what's the impact of adding that little bit of uncertainty to the dust map. So next slide, you can see what the uh, Simeon et al. from Yulia Simeon looks like for uh, NGC 6569. And in fact, if, if you can, uh, Andrea, go back and forth a little bit, you can, whoop, yeah, you'll see in the star field, go to the star field. If you kind of squint, there's those yellow patches where even the two mass colors, even in the near infrared, you see a little bit of that extinction just to the left of the cluster. And sure enough, in the extinction map, Yulia finds it. She finds the, the denser ISM that's in there. And this is substantial extinction that we need to uh, to account for. So we correct the data for this extinction map. Next slide. Um, and then what we do is we selection, select an extinction law and we use dust extinction, um, which is an affiliated package of AstroPy that allows us to select from a number of different extinction laws. There are different extinction laws with different parameterizations for different um, ISM environments, whether it's a very dense environment or a more diffuse environment, um, things that have been verified at different regimes in the Milky Way. And so that allows us to then add some randomized component, say um, within a tenth of a magnitude, let's say we're gonna add some randomized component. And then we're gonna use um, MCMC to, to fit isochrones to the cluster. And in particular, we're gonna let MCMC be blind to that addition 
additional extinction that we added. So next slide. And when we do that, um, for example, for NGC 6569, what we did this summer was add to just the core um, of 6569. Our next step will be to include some of these extra tidal star candidates that have been um, discovered. These are the core stars that have been um, confirmed with Gaia. So this doesn't go all the way down to the full depths of, of BDBS, but just shows the brighter stars. And we added some unknown amount of extinction. And um, MCMC is able to find the parameters of the cluster, the distance, the metallicity, and the age of the cluster that we're going to need then in further analysis. And this is work that was done, um, that was designed and performed by my student, Kyle Webster, uh, Kyle Webster here at Western. He's graduating this year, and you'll be able to see some of this work at the AAS meeting um, as well. So um, next slide. What we did then is change slightly the added extinction to see how the parameters of the cluster change. And what we found for the um, uh, pass bands and for the exact stars that we're using in NGC 6569 is it only really changes the distance to the cluster. Um, but this is very different than what we tried with a different cluster. So this is a totally different cluster. Next slide that I'm going to show you here. This is Segway 3. It's using different data. But you can see that we got very different results. We, in fact, got a different age and just different metallicity for that cluster by including some unknown extinction. But in fact, it didn't change the distance that much. So one of the things that we're wanting to do here is sort of show a roadmap for what, how people people can proceed to assess that if you know your extinction correction, say to you know, five hundredths of a magnitude, what kind of error bars does that give you on your cluster parameters? Once you have that, then once you have the cluster, par cluster parameters, it allows you then to really understand that cluster and when you do the follow-up spectroscopy of your um, extra tidal star candidates, you can really identify which ones are likely to be extra tidal of that particular cluster. So next slide. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Joanne Hughes, who's going to talk about um, some of the follow-up spectroscopy of this same cluster, 6569. Hi, I'm Joanne Hughes. I'm an associate professor in the physics department in Seattle University. And my task was taking a look at the spectra that Andrea and her team got at the AAT this summer. Next slide. 6569 is an interesting cluster. It's massive enough that we should expect, if this is working the way we think it is physically, a considerable population of extra tidal stars. And the orbit on the lower right is for about half a billion years. So you can expect that this cluster should have shed enough stars over its approximately 12.8 giga years of life, whether it's actually been in this area of the Milky Way the whole time. We'll discuss that at a later time. But this is from the Vasiliev and Baumgart survey and Baumgart's website, which has all of the latest data, including the Gaia data on the known globular clusters. Next slide. Andrea then took the BDBS data and the, the information on this particular cluster and went to select stars that were beyond the tidal radius, which is about six half minutes in this cluster, out to about five tidal radii, which had the right colors for the giant branch and also some variable stars were selected. And these were the targets at the AAT with A Omega. And we were hopeful that a significant proportion of these stars would actually turn out to be shared cluster members. This cluster is studied in the cluster itself in that the Johnson Doll study had got spectra with on high resolution VLT and also with calcium triplet spectra, which we were aiming for too. And we can have 100 stars on the cluster itself from the Johnson paper, 
so that we can really look for the extra tidal stars with the correct properties. Next slide. So this is a plot of the stars from the Johnson paper and our own data from this summer. And we use the calcium triplet to measure the radio velocities. And as you can see in green, the central cluster is there. And it turned out that we had approximately about 82 stars between radio velocities of zero and minus 100. And Johnson found that the, the central cluster had a radio velocity of about minus 49 plus or minus five kilometers per second. So it had a, a reasonable dispersion considering this was the VLT and the data should have been much better than that. So this is just, could have been just a massive cluster. So we then, next slide also checked the cluster parameters. Again, it, this is an additional check with a program that is independent from the one Kristen's team was using. The Azteca program is using the Parsec isochrones to compare an on cluster and off cluster field and do a Bayesian analysis to figure out the cluster parameters trying to avoid any kind of human biases and get the best data that you possibly can with all of the information, including all of the colors and all of the radio velocities and all of the Gaia data. And this is what my team at Seattle U was working on mostly this summer while I was working on the spectra. So next slide. This particular cluster as Kristen mentioned with the extinction map, and you can see on the left-hand side, the star counts are also showing that you've got considerable extinction patches there. And the Gaia data, which we were originally using to pick out these stars, as well as the BDBS data, if you're going in certain directions away from the cluster, if you're trying to pick out stars which are potential extra tidal candidates, this extinction is probably going to bias in certain regions, but we'll see how that works out. But this program is also good for finding the tidal radii and we fit King model. And again, this is part of the data which is also going to be at the AAS with my students who are named below, but mentioning Sarah, Matthew, and Christina, and Connor also did some work on this this summer. Next slide. Here are the radio velocities we got out of the data. We also added in Christian Johnson's 100 stars from the cluster center and it's radi radiating out approximately five tidal radii. So the 305 fibers gave us back 304 usable spectra. And on the right-hand side here, you can see that this is Christian Johnson's calcium triplet metallicities compared to the high resolution spectra as well. So we are more expecting to get his kind of resolution for these objects. But you can see that this cluster is actually defined from about minus 65 kilometers per second to maybe about minus 30 kilometers a second before you do any further analysis. Next slide. And here's an example of the spectra, one of these extra tidal stars with the calcium triplet showing the, the lab wavelength in black and the actual object. So therefore we use this calibration, which is a little different than the usual conversion from the calcium triplet to Fe over H mainly because we wanted to use the I passbands rather than the normal K passbands, just to use the BDBS data alone. 
but it works pretty well and is completely consistent with the data that Johnson reported. So we're expecting individual stars to have an uncertainty of between 0.1 and 0.2 dex, but in practice, we're probably getting some of the stars back to about 0.05, but we're also taking several measurements and several calibrations just to make sure that we're being self-consistent with all of the other surveys. So we're on the same calibration scheme. Next slide. So what would we expect to see from a stripped cluster? The GALA program, which comes from Adrian Price Will and, and his team, will take the cluster parameters and evolve it in the galactic potential for the lifetime of the cluster. And this is a, a plot on the left-hand side of RA versus radial velocity. So, and in the red box, this is approximately the five tidal radii that you would see around it and the range in radio velocity that you would expect for this cluster from Christian Johnson's data. So on the right hand side, you've got the histograms of the radio velocity. So you would expect this is the whole field of the dispersed cluster. Then for our field of view, you would expect actually to see the peak on the cluster and you get very few objects scattering above minus 60 kilometers per second, sorry, below. And, but there are a number of stars in our field of view which can be scattered to actually many standard deviations between minus 40 and actually about plus 55 kilometers per second but it's only a very small proportion of the stars. So if you're putting fibers on a general field of view, the chances of you getting all of these may actually be fairly low. So into this model, I added some Gaussian noise and generally on the bottom right, you would see this is the noised up data from the model. So you, again, you would expect about the radio velocity of the cluster, but you may expect some scattering between about minus 75 and about minus 20 in this field of view if your data was noisier than the data that we got from the AAT. So next slide. So this is actually what we found. So in the central histogram, the, the green stars are the extra tidal stars, which fit the radio velocities in the range. And the blue stars are the central cluster Christian Johnson's data. And the top histogram is his metallicities from the calcium triplet. And when we put them all together, they're completely consistent the means and the standard deviations are consistent. So our data has got an internal uncertainty in the radio velocities of about minus two kilom uh, plus or minus two kilometers per second. And it's slightly worse than the VLT as expected, but it's all completely consistent. And we found about 38 extra tidal giant stars, but out of 304 measurable spectra. So the rest of the, the stars had inconsistent radio velocities, but instead of just going for the calcium triplet, the next stage is actually to look at the iSpec program just to see if we can find any chemical signatures of globular cluster stars in our field of view, which have just ended up scattered to different radial velocities. So that's the next step. Next slide. So again, what does it look like spatially? 
we put our about 140 stars on a map of RA versus RV, and we see that the general spread fits what we'd expect for the tidal distribution from the Gala model to show. And then we put it on an actual map with scales for the calcium triplet Fe over H and for the radial velocities and doing the fit between about minus 63 kilometers per second and minus 30 kilometers per second, the tidal tails pop out completely consistent with the Gala models. So this gives us a reasonable amount of confidence that this method is going to work, but it's also telling us that purely selecting the RGB stars by their colors is probably not going to define the tidal tails as well. So follow-up observations with spectros spectroscopy are very important. Next slide. Thank you. Now I'll briefly talk about our results for the globular cluster BH261, which is located here in the bulge. BH261 is an understudied cluster. There has been only three papers talking about it. Um, it was first cataloged as an open cluster, and then the first paper in 2006 showed that it actually had a color magnitude diagram consistent with a globular cluster. Um, since then, there was a study done in um, uh, 2021 that determined a radial velocity of this cluster from three stars. They found a color magnitude diagram consistent with a metallicity of minus 1.3 and a distance of 6.1 kiloparsecs. Um, this is again from optical photometry. Last year, the VVV um, group put out a paper on uh, BH261. Uh, they have a color magnitude diagram suggesting a uh, metallicity of minus 2.4, so con considerably more metal poor and also um, more distant. So we targeted this globular cluster not only to look for extra tidal stars, but also to understand a little bit more about it. Um, here are the proper motion of the cluster, and we selected stars that lie along the giant branch as well as the horizontal branch. The red stars show which stars have uh, radial velocities consistent with the, with the cluster. We confirm a uh, horizontal branch of um, in BH261. And we have a sample of 11 uh, giant stars belonging to the cluster. They have a radial velocity spread of 12 kilometers per second, suggesting it has a pretty high dynamical mass. We also found one RR Lyrae star in the tidal radius of the cluster with a velocity consistent with membership. And this radial, this RR Lyrae star, uh, RR Lyrae stars are distance indicators. So we constrain the distance of the cluster to 6.5 kiloparsecs. And our, our Lyra stars can also be used to find photometric metallicities, and we recover a metallicity more in line with the what the color magnitude diagram of optical photometry shows of minus 1.23 dec. Um, this, these gray points show the Gala model of what the tidal disruption around this cluster should look like. And these red points show the extra tidal stars with radial velocities consistent with the cluster. And we see a number of them, or all of them actually, lie along the predicted mock stream. So these are all of our extra tidal star candidates around BH261 um, as open circles. And the red ones were the ones with radial velocities consistent with the cluster. And they really do follow the mock stream um, nicely. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Rave, and I'm leading the effort to find the chemical abundances of the stars in and around BH261. <clears throat> uh, we are currently using the iSpec tool written by Sergey Blanco for asthma in 2014 for our analysis of the stellar abundances. We want to find the spectroscopic metallicities of not only our large sample of stars within BH261, but also in the surrounding field. In this way, we can also use the metallicity as a diagnostic to characterize our candidate extra tidal stars. So just press down to yeah. Okay. We're still working on the exact details uh, to find the best continuum normalization and element, elemental line list to use for uh, abundances with iSpec. 
but I wanted to show some preliminary results. Here's the spectra of a BH261 horizontal branch star. We were excited to confirm this, uh, excuse me, we were excited to confirm this spectroscopically that BH261 has an extended horizontal branch, but these stars are too hot for us to get a reliable metallicity. The hydrogen passion lines dominate in this wavelength regime, and we were not successful in extracting iron from these stars. Fortunately, most of the stars are giant stars. Uh, here's a spectra of a BH261 giant star. The three calcium triplet lines are clearly visible and very useful in getting a good radial velocity measurement. There are still a number of iron lines and a handful of silicon and magnesium lines that are also visible in our wavelength regime. The spectral synthesis from iSpec suggests that this star is a metallicity of negative one. In comparison, here's a spectrum of a giant star that does not have a radial velocity consistent with BH261. The iron lines are more pronounced uh, in the star and the spectral synthesis from iSpec suggests that this uh, is a solar, me solar metallicity, which is typical for a, blue, for a bold star in the field. Uh, the spectrum looks like it is a hotter star, so not something I can get reliable metallicity for. Its position on the color magnitude diagram indicates that if star did belong to BH261, it should be a horizontal branch star. And the hot spectrum does indicate it is a horizontal branch star as opposed to a bulge field giant star. So the spectrum does, not, does appear more consistent with the star belonging to BH261 that has been tidally stripped than to the underlying bulge field. Hello, so I'm Evan Butler, uh, an undergraduate at University of Washington, majoring in physics and astronomy, and I'm working to help characterize the stellar population in and around the potential cluster Patrick 99. Here I am at the Anglo-Australian Telescope in July, helping collect our spectroscopic observations of what I'll be presenting. And here to the right is the location of Patrick 99. It's at a relatively low latitude, around negative six degrees, so not as heavily obscured by the disk like some of the older newly discovered globular clusters that lie along the galactic plane above. Next slide. Patrick 99 was first cataloged by Dana Patrick and put forward in a globular cluster as a globular cluster by Minetti et al. in 2017 and 2018 uh, in a compilation of 93 new candidate bulge globular clusters. Once Gaia proper motions were released, a paper by Gran et al. in 2019 refuted 91 of these 93 new globular clusters. And this is because they didn't find a grouping of stars with similar proper motions at the positions of these clusters. Last year, Garo et al. confirmed Patrick 99 was a globular cluster uh, using DVV and Gaia photometry and proper motions. They found that stars near Patrick 99 have a bimodal distribution in proper motion uh, shown by the blue curve. Um, and the bulge stars ha field has uh, proper motions centered around negative two milliarc seconds per year, the gray histogram. Um, and Patrick 99 has proper motion centered around negative six milliarc seconds per year, the green and red histograms. To the left, the bulge and field show very similar color magnitude. Um, as shown here. Uh, to date, there have been no spectroscopic observations of stars in and around the cluster, uh, so there's no known radial velocity or spectroscopic metallicity. Uh, next slide. This plot uh, shows all the BDBS stars within 2.4 arc minutes of the central region of Patrick 99. We selected BDBS stars with proper motions consistent with the cluster and that lie along the giant branch of the cluster as our spectroscopic candidates. We also observed seven aurelaries that were claimed to belong to the cluster, none of which were within 2.4 arc minutes. And they also have a pretty large spread in their proper motion. These are shown by the red star symbols. Lastly, we observed some red clump stars from Christian Johnson's BDBS red clump catalog that have proper motions consistent with Patrick 99 and photometric metallicities indicating they are slightly more metal poor than the bulge field. Next slide. Here are the radial velocities of the giant stars observed in blue. 
um, the two black triangles uh, to the right show the red clump stars we observed. There isn't as obvious a clumping of stars in radio velocity space as we'd expect in a bona fide globular cluster. Next slide. Here are the radio velocities of the R Larrys uh, we observed in red. I corrected the center of mass radial velocity by using an R Larry radial velocity template and the period and time of maximum light as specified by Ogle. The radial velocities of the R Larry stars have an uncertainty of 10 to 15 kilometers per second. Curiously, a number of the R Larrys near the cluster have a velocity around negative or positive uh, 95 kilometers per second, whereas the rest of the R Larrys and red clumps have velocities around 40. Um, they don't show the same large spread in radial velocity as we see in the giants, and so we want to look more into this. In particular, I'm now working on getting metallicities of these stars to see if there's any chemical indication that some of them have a common origin. Perhaps Patrick 99 was once part of a larger system that's now dissolving in the field. But what's apparent is that the large spread in both proper motion, radial and radial velocity, the paucity of stars populating a giant branch, and having a color magnitude diagram so similar to the field it makes Patrick 99 not a typical bulge copular cluster, and we're not convinced that it is a bulge copular cluster. Next slide. So to conclude, we are really thankful for the Kickstarter grants to give us time on the Anglo-Australian Telescope to um, confirm extratidal stars around um, bulge globular clusters. We were able to find about 40 extratidal stars around NGC 6569 and around 20 um, extratidal stars around BH261. We see that the bulge field is very crowded and complicated. Um, using LSST passbands alone is not going to be sufficient for a uh, a, a, a very clean sample of extratidal stars, but will be good targets for follow-up spectroscopy for radio velocities and uh, metallicities. Um, we're not sure what to make of Patrick 99. It is not a typical globular cluster. It may not be a globular cluster. It is curious that the RLI ray stars have similar radio velocities, and um, we are still doing simulations to see if, uh, if this, some of these observations could be consistent with Patrick 99 being a, a disrupted um, a cluster. We have a number of AAS presentations. Um, the AAS is in Seattle this year, and we're all local to that area. So please come find us in uh, Seattle. We will be there in person. And here are our um, a, a list of the different presentations we will be giving in January there. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers today. That was a really tremendous body of work that you've all put together and a, a tremendous collaborative effort. So congratulations on all of those results. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the Zoom chat. Uh, we have a little bit of time uh, in the seminar. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, use the chat and um, we will come to those. To get the ball rolling, I, I have one of my own. And that is, if we look towards LSST, um, your work has clearly highlighted the importance of uh, reasonably high resolution spectroscopy over large areas of these clusters in order to properly characterize these clusters and actually prove that these stars are members of the clusters. So that's going to be a pretty substantial follow-up program, isn't it? And you're going to need, assuming that LSST um, looks towards much fainter clusters, then you're going to need some fairly substantial telescopes to do that. Am I correct? Yeah, so that's an issue, follow-up spectroscopy. So the um, we observe one hour on the AAT to get the giants. So if we can find giants around globular clusters, we can get elemental abundances, um, which will be really great in, in, in an hour-long exposure. So I think reaching the main sequence turnoff, which is where most of the Tile debris is probably going to be because there's more mass in the cluster at um, lower metal or low, lower mass stars. That will be difficult. Um, we're excited for spectroscopic surveys coming online, like foremost, um, mm -hmm. which is going to target just a, a wide sample of stars um, that we can maybe tap into an apogee. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, going to be ultimately really important and something that we have to figure out how we can. Um, get the spectroscopy that that we need for the for the inner galaxy. 
Is there any way you can make use of LSST's multiple uh, optical passbands, maybe perhaps in combination with um, infrared data, as a sort of low-resolution spectroscopy? Yeah, so that's something that we um, need to look into more. Uh, we have BBV photometry mm -hmm. of all of the BDBS stars, and we have the U-band in BDBS. And um, you know, Christian's paper showed that that can definitely be done for red clump stars. And it would be great if we could look more, even if it's a crude estimate, you know, doing that. Um, and that's something that we uh, have have not really had a chance to look into yet. We hope with our spectroscopic metallicities, that's something we can we can do more of once once we get to that point. But that would be that would be fantastic and um, w would be great. Definitely a subject for preparatory work then. So please do anyone, if you have any other questions for our speakers, do jump in. Uh, both feel free to post them in the meeting chat. I could talk about this subject all day. So in while we're waiting for other people to um, post their questions, one thing that does interest me in the sub the context of survey strategy for LSST is um, so if the entire sky is uh, of the southern hemisphere, if where should we look in particular for these disrupted streams that you mentioned at the start? Andre? Um, yeah, so where should we look for the disrupted streams? Um, Is it just we should survey the entire sky or are there areas in particular that we haven't looked at before? Um, I want to say something that if we find the variable stars with OSST, then that'll probably tell you where the streams are going to be. It's just finding anything fainter following the stream is going to be a little harder, especially with the very high extinction. So it's, it's going to be a combination of finding the variable stars, modeling the streams, and really getting targeted follow-up where you can actually deal with the extinction. Oh, that's interesting, because I kind of assumed that you would be more interested in in deep co-added images in multiband filters of a very large area of the sky, but you're saying you want time series observations to identify RLI rays and other variable types? You're most likely going to find the clusters that way, and they'll mm. they will pop out from the LSST data. So right. as well as well as the co-added data, you need to find the streams first of all. And the variable stars from the globular clusters are quite likely to trace the streams. Okay. Well, that's really good to know then. I've definitely learned something new today. And but one thing that's so exciting about LSST is that we're not always going to know what to expect. I feel like the field of streams has always been surprising. We find these really thin streams. And we wonder mm. how can the streams be so thin, you know? And, um, uh, and and so I think we're going to be surprised with how the field develops. And I love the strategy of LSST to just survey the whole sky mm. and uh, homogeneously in a systematic manner, and then see what we find. And I expect that um, we will uh, be surprised um, about what kind of what kind of streams and substructure is still. Um, it's, it's still hasn't hasn't been seen yet in in our in our Milky Way. Well, that's really interesting to me because I I guess that's kind of the point that I'm getting at. We've put in a great deal of work on the survey strategy for LSST, and as you know, lots of different science cases. There's sort of some tension between some of them, so we're we're looking at what how much of the galactic plane area that we can actually look at, and there's. Some people want to do small areas in high cadence and other air, other science cases call for looking at as wide an area as possible. And what I'm hearing is that 
uh, for this science, you'd be interested in covering it just as much as possible, as uniformly as possible. Is that right? Well, we would take anything. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, T is going to be such a step forward, honestly. Right. I mean, even if, I mean, the amount of sky that you survey is, is going to be so vast. Um, I'm particularly interested in that inner galaxy. So I think the more inner galaxy observations you can take for the variable stars, that would also be exciting. Um, That's great to hear. That dovetails with a lot of other science. So I, that is absolutely the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> I don't know what, what other people think, though. I've only just got interested in the inner galaxy globular clusters, but looking at the orbits, there has to be, a, because I was thinking about the variable stars, they have to be trailing out all over the bulge, if that's true. if these clusters are all over 12 billion years old, you're going to find, you need to find the variable stars, then you need to do follow-up spectroscopy because you're going to have to try and chemically tag these stars and find a common origin. Mm. So it's, you're going to have to do really hammer the bulge to find all of the variable stars and then do targeted follow-up to find particular stars and trace them back to a system of origin. That does sound like a, a really substantial uh, follow-up program, but a fascinating one without a doubt. Well, we are at the top of the hour again, so let me thank all of our speakers today for a really fascinating talk. That was absolutely terrific. And um, I look forward to hearing more of your research in future. That's an uh, outstanding collaboration. Thank you for that. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. See you next time. Oh.